this is the status of the uh, Unicor project, um, better known as the project to migrate Umbraco into .NET Core. And first, we need to talk about what is Umbraco 8 and what is the difference to .NET Core. Um, first of all, the architecture of Umbraco 8 was, as uh, showed here, we had a few assemblies, uh, mainly Umbraco Core and Umbraco Web had all the uh, all the code base. Um, as you can see, thousand files, CS files in uh, in the web, and almost one thousand five hundred files in uh, Umbraco Core. And I know files is not a good measure because some files is only a couple uh, twenty twenty lines, and some files in Umbraco is uh, three thousand lines. So it's a bad measure, but it's pretty clear that most of the code base is uh, located in these two assemblies. The issue now that we have to migrate to .NET Core is that all of our assemblies have a lot of dependencies on third party projects. So basically all of our assemblies know about JSON-Net, they know about MPOGO, which is our object relationship mapper, they know about Examine and so on. And and to migrate Umbraco into .NET Core, we also need to update all our dependencies to compatible versions. So the first step was to re-architecture to make mm, as much as the code base uh, as possible uh, free of these uh, third-party dependencies. So it's a completely other view. If we start by taking a look from the bottom, we have uh, the Umbraco core, it's a little bit uh, smaller this time, but now there is no dependencies on third party uh, projects. Then we have a new project called um, uh, Umbraco infrastructure and a couple of small uh, infrastructure assemblies also, which is more specific. So one for configuration, one for our publishing. In this case, uh, the new cache, but in theory, you could implement your own and one for examine Lucene and so on. Sorry, there was a cat, maybe you can hear it. Um, the green colors are net standard. So this means this code is ex can be executed both from framework and from .NET Core. The blue is still uh, framework and the purple ones are .NET Core. So right now we actually have two executables, one for framework and one for .NET Core. We aim for moving all this code, but we have to migrate it. We have to, especially the ASP.NET part that needs to be migrated to ASP.NET Core. So especially the Umbraco web, which before the migration was around thousand files, we still need to migrate, yeah almost 400 files. Most of these files are moved into the infrastructure because in theory, there was no web specific stuff in there. It was just by convenience, by convenience it was located uh, together with the web. But the remaining stuff is purely ASP.NET stuff like controllers, model builders, filters, and so on. So the future, we will remove the uh, .NET framework executable and the uh, Umbraco web. So we will have the new executable, which is comparable to your projects when you use Umbraco. Right now, there's only two CS files, the ones that is created when you just make an uh, .NET Core project, a main method or program CS, I guess it's called, and a startup. And from here you had you have to add Umbraco like every other dependency. And then we have separated our web into web website and web back office and web common. The main idea here, here is that when you are using load balancing, only one of your servers need to have the back office. So you have a way smaller footprint on these uh, 
front-end servers or website servers. If I go back, you can see right now we still have the examine machine and the SQL uh, compact edition as framework. Compact edition is not available in frame uh, in .NET Core, so we can't move that. It will never work unless you use Windows. For uh, examine Lucene, there's a beta version of Lucene running net standard, and we we aim for migrating that too. But right now, time is working for us because hopefully it will be out of beta when we uh, when we need it. Otherwise, Shannon is part of the, that open source project also, so he knows the code base very well. Yes, if we take a view on the project, as you can see, we started with all the infrastructure and abstractions, uh, so basically the two new big assemblies, and then we worked on configuration, we separated all the SQL Compact Edition. In, in version 8, it's tight, version 8 is tightly coupled to SQL Compact Edition. Now it is possible to, to run on Braco without uh, SQL Compact Edition, but if the DLLs are in the bin folder, then Umbraco picks up what it needs. Um, also, imaging is uh, changed from image processor into image sha. And we started by doing a, uh, a abstraction. So right now in Umbrago 8, there's a lot of places where we just add query strings to the image path to resize. But in theory, these query strings could be different if we use another provider. It's just pure luck that image sharp is created by the same person as uh, image processes. So all the query strings still work, but in theory, uh, these should be able to change. And they are now, so that's why it's uh, split into two. We also migrated the publishing, so our uh, new cache. The biggest issue here is that we have a dependency on uh, B plus tree, which originally, is not uh, available uh, in that standard, but there exists a fork, and for now I only found a single issue, um, which we can fix ourselves is, uh, if it's necessary. And then we worked on trimming the web um, assembly, and currently, as you can see, we are working on users, which is a big, big task because in Umbrac 8, users is implemented using ASP.NET identity, and we need to migrate that to ASP.NET core identity. And we also have a big task for members, because that use an e even older technology called membership providers, and we need to move that into or migrate that into a ASP.NET core identity also. But that task is not started yet, but in theory, we could start but we try to focus on uh, back office. We, we want to have the back office running as fast as possible. So that is why members is not uh, worked on yet. In theory, we could also start on uh, updating our Nougat uh, packages. Of course, we need to update to all the new assemblies and all the new references. Um, and documentation could also be started yet or already. But as you can see, we are we are not even half in the update executables. So the one about eliminating um, um Braga web. So the start estimate was 2,354 story points, and now we are at 1,584. So we have a steady burn down. If we look at the velocity, we have an average of, I think it's 54 or something like that. Uh, we started only Shannon and I, uh, and then we have a Christmas vacation and we spend a lot of time establishing the team. But as soon as we had the team, we actually started to burn even more uh, uh, points. And some of the biggest challenging 
challenges in uh, in tracking our burn down is that most of the up for grabs task is not burning any points themselves, but they are removing hurdles for us when we burn down uh, burn. Uh, points because some of our tasks is migrate a controller and if that controller uses filters or something that also needs to be uh, migrated it's kind of a rabbit hole every time we we take a new task um, so a lot of the up for grabs task basically says this is a big task you can't resolve the, this in one pr but find an area where you solve some of it, like moving filters or moving some of the uh, unit tests and so on. And yeah, the last, the, the current sprint is in the middle of the sprint, so it's not ended yet. Then we have some definitions. We have, we define milestone one as we have something running on .NET Core we aim for 3.1, which is the current long-term support. Uh, and it will not be feature complete. It will be missing either the website or back, of, back office functionality. And at this point, you can still expect a lot of undocumented breaking changes between each version. And everything about members will be missing. And we, will don't, we, don't, we will not have a nice way to install on Braggly yet, so no NuGet packages and no .NET new template. The second milestone, at this point we expect the CMS to be complete. We, ex we still expect some breaking changes, but at this point we will document what is going on. And this is the point where we expect package developers to start and also give feedback, so if anything needs to change, then this is the point uh, in time. And of course, then we will show everyone or document what is uh, what has changed. The third milestone is when also the HQ, HQ packages is available. So we have the starter kit, we have forms, we have deploy and so on. And the time for these, uh, if we start from the bottom again, the milestone three is around the full estimate minus 200 and 50 story points. Milestone two is the full estimate minus 550 story points. And the first milestone is the full estimate minus 1300 uh, story points. So for availability, and this is our best guesses, remember this is estimates, so full disclaimer, but we, uh, we expect to have milestone one or hit milestone one in uh, the second half of this year, actually in the beginning of the second half. We also hope that we can reach the second milestone in, uh, in this year, but now it's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, it basically it's, it's estimates. So shit can happen and we will, hit next year before and milestone three is without doubt next year but we still uh, expect the first half so how to get involved currently we have some up for grabs uh, we have as i said earlier it's most about big tasks where, where you can't solve them solve the entire task in one pr but you can pick up one area and, uh, and so so like migrating the existing tests right now we have one big test suite that runs uh, framework and it's a combination of unit tests and integration tests so these have to be migrated into two new projects one for unit tests and one for integration tests so basically we aim for having unit tests isolated so we have the possibility to execute a lot of tests very fast instead of uh, like now we have to wait 20 minutes every time we uh, execute our progress or test suite. Um, another thing that is up for grabs is help writing acceptance test and this is actually for V8 but 
these tests are stable between the migrations. So the more tests we have on BA, the more confident we are uh, when migrating that everything is still working. Then we have tasks about helping migrating ASP.NET to ASP.NET Core. This is one of these tasks where you can pick one filter, you can pick a model binder, uh, whatever, and migrate it. These are a little bit hard to verify that stuff is actually working. So often you will need to also migrate and controller in the same time and verify uh, stuff is working. And finally, we have one about refactoring services and controllers that write SQL themselves. So we would like all the SQL to be maintained or be written in one project. Uh, so right now, the reason the Umbraco infrastructure is such a big assembly still is that all the, uh, all the repositories, everything about the SQL database has to exist here. And it's not necessarily part of this project to solve it, but it, it will be breaking changes. So the more we can solve uh, doing this project, the better. And then uh, I'll try to show a short demo if the demo guards are happy. So I started the Umbraco solution, if I just find the correct, if we, go, oh. if we go back and take a look here. So here I started using the framework executable. So it's not the current state uh, of, the, of the .NET Core, but here we actually verify that all of the code base that is migrated into the standard is still working and it's around 75% of our code base that is already migrated. And this is also our acceptance test suite. Um, so it's just a lot of simple tests right now. So like creating a data type and deleting a data type, creating a document type, deleting a document type and so on. Uh, but as you can see, the back office is, is still functioning and actually also the website is functioning here. Um, but in this case, we, as I said, we still only use 75% of the same code base. Hopefully it will succeed. So far, so good. Yeah, Forks has succeeded. And as you can see, it is just the back office as we know it. So the second demo is a bit more complicated. I'll have to change branch two seconds. And hopefully it will build. So Bjarke, um, quick question. While we wait, yep. Yep. I think uh, I think Monday we had uh, a login screen working. Yep. And now I see a full back office working. Yeah, and that's what I said. When you see the full back office, it's still using the framework executable. So it's still using ah, okay. all the old stuff, but 75% of the code base is shared with what will be the new uh, executable, which is what I will try to start here. And Matt is asking if the Cypress code setup is uh, somewhere to look at. We just committed it to the V8 dev branch. It's called uh, Bronco Acceptance Tests. You want to look at that. And that's all. Uh, Bjarke has been really happy with Cypress, and he's been hacking away for a few months trying to get get it to work uh, yeah. nicely. There's helpers for uh, for specific uh, things as well that are that are really cool. Yeah, it's, it's a bit complicated to get started, uh, especially with Umbrago, because when you log in, uh, the first time there will appear a tour. So we need to take care of that case. And the second time you log in, there will pop up another model. And we need to take care of that. And <laughs> so I tried to build 
a library that took care of all this, uh, these things and to be able to share between uh, both HQ uh, products like Forms and, and Braco, but also for community to uh, use. That'd be really so, useful, so that I can do the same with the vendor, ideally. Oh, yep, yes. Exactly. Yeah. And it's also open source. So right now, it's on my account. Maybe we will move it into Embargo. I don't know uh, if it makes sense. So now you should see uh, a login screen. Try to... One thing to note is right now, I don't have any dependencies on SQL Compact Edition. So you don't have the uh, fast install button. But if I added a, a project reference to the uh, Umbrago Persistence uh, SQL CE project, then it will appear and you can install as uh, usual. But as I said, it is running framework, so it will only work on Windows and it is more luck than, uh, than expected behavior that is actually working. It is because it uses APIs from framework that is actually part of net standard, but the package itself is not moved to net standard. So I created an, an empty database here. So completely empty, just called net call. And I'll try to install. Just whilst we're waiting, uh, Callum had a question for the Netcore team. Well, that was quick. <laughs> uh, which is what's in the umbraco.web.website? website? Is this the MVC rendering engine? No, it's it is the stuff that is needed when you have Umbraco on a load balance setup to render the website part so not the back office part because when you are using load balancing you will in theory only uh, you will in theory could exclude could exclude the back office dlo and that's also why the web.common is quite big because there is a lot of shared things between uh, the back office and the website and you can't you, you need that anyway but all the controllers for the back office is only necessary on the server where you host the back office. So this is the bleeding edge of, uh, of the Netcore project. It is in a feature branch. It's not even merged yet. We expect this to be merged in to our uh, Netcore slash Netcore branch next week. And I forgot to say right now we run using two uh, base branches. We have one called netcore slash dev, which is where you can use the back office in the framework version. So when you have to update anything in the back office or in the Braco core or something like that, then you can still verify stuff is working. I use that every week where I migrate uh, or merge V8 into this branch to ensure stuff is still working. And then we have the net core slash net core branch where we start to move files from the, or the controllers move these files into the back office. And again, this is because if we copy these files, all the changes that is done to V8 is lost. And so it's, it's a bit complicated. And we learned from V7 to V8 that merging is one of the biggest tasks when we do such a big project. And I'll try to log in. And as you can see, this is the back office right now. We don't even load anything because we haven't migrated trees. We haven't migrated anything yet. So this is the bleeding edge. But things are starting to coming together. That was uh, my demo. So any or oh, more questions? <laughs> that was awesome. Well then. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think there are some questions. Encouraging clapping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was amazing. Um, yeah, there's been some questions posted in the group chat. So I think Callum had a follow-up one about uh, the entry point application. I don't know if you want to ask it yourself, Callum. 
Uh, Andy answered it, so it's all good. Oh, right, sorry, yeah. Nice. And then yeah. Lars had a question about linking files. No, that linking. was more like a suggestion. Instead of copying, you can do linking as long as people don't, uh, as long as people keep the same structure for their branches, you can link files instead of copying. So that's a bit simpler. But I'm writing another question. You can ask the other question. In the <laughs> yeah, you can now. use your voice. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, I'll, uh, I'll use my voice, but it's um, I could kind of uh, spend half an hour talking to Bjork about this. So maybe. Uh, later, okay. but, we have breakout rooms available if that's what you want to do. <laughs> yeah, but let me let me state the problem then, because um, this has been bothering me with version eight for a long, long time. That the the new cache stuff is basically not tested very much at all in version 8. So version 8 is still running tests with the XML version of the cache. So everything is validated with the old version 7 XML tests. So are there any plans or any way we could help the community help adding tests for using JSON cache for published content instead of the old XML stuff? And Possibly making all the internal and private crap that's in core and even the tests for published content, which in my mind is the is the core of this system. It's what we're working with. We're working with published content all the time. So and that stuff is really, really, really hard to test. And I saw you have this community effort to move the tests. So what's your view on and making that way more friendly to use for unit testing and even actually test the stuff that we're using in production for cache today. Yeah, we, we started by, we started by um, abstracting the cache. So now we actually know exactly what is new cache and <laughs> can, can start testing that. But our new integration test uh, framework or suite is testing way more of the same code as that would go into production. So our current integration tests have a lot of mocks and is actually not testing that much of the actual code base. So one of the upper grabs task was moving tests. So if we could move these tests into uh, the new mid standard, uh, yeah, mid core integration test project, then it should actually run all tests using the actual or the correct new cache instead of the old uh, XML cache. But it's not direct, directly tested. We don't, we still need unit tests and Everyone is free to add unit tests for that. Really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm kind of throwing stones in a glass house here. But um, continuing on that, um, uh, trying hard as shit not to trample on anybody, everybody knows here. But uh, what's your view on making a lot of stuff more public this time around so it's easier to test both inside and outside of the in Docker? Oh, it's a good question. Um, Shannon and I are discussing this <laughs> very often. Um, right now, a lot of the code is turned into public at the moment. Uh, so I don't like that we have invisible, uh, what's called invisible uh, to what's called something. internal. Internal oh, visible to internal too. visible to yeah yeah I don't like that we today have internals visible to in our web projects so we can use internal stuff from the core uh, so at least between our own test project or our own production assemblies these will be correct public ah that's good so it sounds like it's going in the right direction then yeah the biggest yeah. issue is the more public the more <laughs> chances or Chances is that we we are breaking anything, and we have to be careful. You you could always do the same as Microsoft has always done. They type it in the in the comments, uh, the uh, 
summary thing that generates comments for uh, IntelliSense and everything. This is intended for internal use. Don't use it. Don't call it. If you call it, yeah. you call it on your own. Uh, exactly. We, it, it would most likely be something like that because uh, a couple of years ago, Microsoft tried out to have a namespace called internals and use that as the indicator. But people are still using everything and complain when they break anything. So it was, they are going back to having internals. And we are having a fight right now uh, doing the uh, users, users migration. I know Shannon have created two issues on the ASP.NET Core tracker because too much is internal. So we are kind of eat, <laughs> eating our own eating your own right medicine. Now. Yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm optimistic. Uh, I, I hope I can find something to. Yeah, but again, when when we reach milestone, something. when we reach milestone two, this kind of feedback is very valuable because we can change it at that time, and we still have something working. So. That's the correct time to, uh, yeah, to mention it again at least. I know yeah. you will mention it every time we meet. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> awesome. Um, I guess if I mean if there are any other questions, we will have breakout time afterwards, and then hopefully some of the .NET Core uh, team will stick around. But it seems like you guys have done an amazing job. Um, so another round of applause for you. Well, we call it a candid contributions co-patch clap. Say that five times fast. <laughs>